It's Feedback Gaming, back with another Dev Diary. After how many months? I think it's been like two months, maybe? So I didn't do the last Dev Diary before Waking the Tiger came out. I also missed last week's Dev Diary, which I'm open to going back to. If you guys want me to do an overview and talk about it, feel free to comment below and say, return to the previous Dev Diary, I'd ever like to see it. The question is, why has it been so long? Well, when I came back from uh, ParadoxCon, I got really ill. And I was out of, pretty much out of it for like two or three weeks. A few people have commented on my last series saying that, man, David, some of the videos just sound exceptionally, I don't know, quiet and you don't sound very well. Well, the honest truth is my health sucks. It, it is really crappy. And I was thinking about making a video on it. Would you guys like to see a video on it? Would you like me to talk about it? Yet again, guys, I'm going to leave it up to you guys. You guys can vote below in the comments. But anyway, here we go. We have a dev diary. We have a national focus tree, a new rework of the United Kingdom on the 4th of July. Yeah, I know today's not the 4th of July, but this was released yesterday. Today being the 5th, depending on when you're watching this video. And here we go. So this is the new expansion pack that is coming up. And it is called Man the Guns, which was announced at Paradox Con. So the first time they've like announced uh, the name of a DLC and gone through some of the things they're going to focus on ahead of time. Usually you get Deb Diaries first, speculation on what the focuses are, and eventually you get the, uh, the actual full release. But we've had the release first, and now we're getting the Deb Diaries. It's like happening in the reverse order. So just to summarize, uh, Dan Linz, which is the lead developer, uh, I think it's the, like he's, he's the lead de developer of Hearts of Iron 4, lead director, um, the main focus of this expansion pack is going to be Navy. And the big naval powers, particularly on the Allied side, are the United Kingdom and the United States. So not only is Navy, the way the combat work being overhauled, which hasn't been talked about in much detail, so we don't actually know what they're changing, but maybe we're going to get combined arms like in Hearts of Iron 3. Um, maybe the way engagements work and detach and maybe we're different because the moment if you get like a one submarine that engages a convoy it could sometimes last up to like a week of like engaging in this one sea tile which is a bit strange uh and which is really annoying too if you want to kind of merge your armies which you can't do that they have announced that they will be naval terrain the only examples he gave was like a naval coastal archipelago which is the example he gave was on the coast of sweden which is many little islands so ships, if they're in that region, will be harder to detect because they could hide in those little island clusters. So it'd be harder for air forces to target them and it more difficult for to actually gauge those ships in those regions. I would imagine, this is a prediction by me, this is not confirmed, but I would take a guess as well that open sea zones would have an attack advantage for carriers where coastal maybe have a disadvantage, which might explain more of the carrier intense warfare in the central Pacific. And would give you kind of an incentive to make different kinds of ships depending on where you're going to be fighting. That's a prediction. I don't actually know if that's going to be true. But that's something I would really would like to see. They've also announced they're bringing back fuel. How is fuel going to work? Well, that was covered in the last Deb Diary. Yet again, if you want me to cover that, feel free to comment below. Say, just go back on the previous Deb Diary and make a video on it. And I'd love to do that for you. What else? Uh, they also have announced that 2 Focus Tree will get a partial rework. And I use the word partial because the Japanese re overhaul was a complete overhaul. Literally, they stripped all the national focus out and built it from the ground up. Why? Well, the Japanese focus tree was severely lacking on comparison to some of the other major powers, which kind of makes sense. But this is the New York national focus tree for the United Kingdom. As you can see, there are elements here that are in the original focus tree, which is in the current base game in the latest release. You've got Reinforced Empire. These are the same. And also you've got uh, uh, limited rearmament here. You can see there's two here that are a little bit different, which I will dive into as well. So those are the two nations that are going to get uh, reworks. And as I said to you, they are partial reworks, so some of the focus tree will still remain. Will that be the case for the United States? I'm going to take a guess that the United States focus tree is still okay. It's not bad, but it's still okay. So I would take a guess they're probably going to do what they've done with this. They're going to partially re-oval it not the whole entire thing. Now, those are the two nations they've confirmed. Nothing else they've confirmed. They said all the other financial focus trees will be for new nations. Comment below, guys. Tell me what you think new nations that don't have a focus tree at the moment will get a new focus tree in this new expansion pack. I would at least, 
I would at least imagine two other nations would get focus trees. What are those nations going to be? I have not the foggiest. I would think Navy still. So I'd be thinking like Australia, New Zealand, but they're already technically done. Maybe they'll have tweaks. Who knows? But it's difficult to say. Anyway, um, they haven't talked much about this, but they said this focus tree, sorry, this expansion will focus on democracy as well. I would really like to see democracy have merit and be able to do things in the game that fascism and communism can't. So communism at the moment seems to have division recovery rate, seems to have kind of like indoctrination which increases stability and fascism seems to at the moment has like organization for the military and also extra recruitable. It'd be kind of cool if democracy kind of had the best of both, like you were literally balancing between getting those bonuses from the either left or the right, but if you drift too far in that direction, you could end up flipping to fascism or communism. This is something I've talked about on stream. Yet again, this is speculation. These are my hopes and dreams. This is completely feedback gaming opinion. This is not actually what's going to be in the game. But I would really like to see democracies like that. Like it literally has, they have to stay in the center for as long as possible. And if they tip too far, it could have dire circumstances where they could flip to a different ideology or lose stability due to that. Like a stability balancing act guys well this is the longest intro i've ever done in a long time let's actually talk about this dev diary Oof. okay so there was two issues with the united kingdom's focus tree one there was too many restrictions behind world tension as well as nations that you could invade their certain ideology wow explain that dave so there was a part of the focus tree where you could invade the netherlands is it still here or have they taken it out completely yeah it is secure the netherlands secure belgium Bellalux intervention, Scandinavian intervention. These were locked behind um, restrictions based on how much of the ideology was growing in these nations. So if I think something like 20 or 30% of Sweden was communist or fascist, you could go for this focus tree and get a Cassus belly to declare war on them. It was it sucked because you just couldn't do that much as the UK. So I, as far as I'm aware, they're going to open up that now. And have options to declare war without those restrictions. Will it mean these ones? I'm not sure these might stay the same. Maybe these ones will change. Who knows? And uh, also the restriction on war tension as well. Uh, the idea that UK is kind of like technologically, te uh, sorry, military de uh, demilitarized uh, to a certain degree, land-wise. Uh, the Navy's still large. Yeah, they, they've got kind of demilitarized at this point in the game, and you've got this point where you've need world tension to go up to kind of remilitarize. So some of these restrictions have been removed, which we'll talk about on the focus trip. Okay, so oh, really quickly. So we got special air service. Um, it does mention somewhere in here about the, what this, it opens up the genius trait um, advisor. What does the genius trait commando advisor do? So this is the wiki regarding military high commands. And the commando trait is here. So the, there are three levels of advisors for high command. So these are high command advisors. That means it's the last three dots. Is there an example I can give on here to click to show? No, it's not. This usually is below here, right about here. And it's like three stars and you have three high command. And these are the high command you can have for certain countries. If you guys want this, I'll link it below. And as you can see, a commando, uh, high command advisor, gives 50% attack for special attack and 50% defense for special forces. There used to be... A kind of expoji strategy as Romania, where let me see if I can find Romania, where you could combine infantry expert and commando because these two stack to get some insanely strong mountaineers and some insanely strong marines. They were referred to as like super Romanian infantry, and they were like quite renowned in in like high level tier meta games to invade the United Kingdom really early. Because, well, the attack bonuses are insane. Literally 10% stacked onto 15. And they can do some hella damage. Particularly if they've got a lot of artillery too. And a lot of decent air support. And that would be pretty sweet. So the question is, there's three levels of high command. Uh, there's specialist, expert, and genius. As you can see, you've got uh, armor specialist for Saudi Arabia. 5% attack and defense. Um, is there another one we can see? Armor expert, you got 10%. So that would have genius would be 15%. The problem is, is that you can't actually see on here. Commando, there we go. You can't actually see because there's only a commando expert. 
So there's no uh, specialist or genius. So it's difficult to say what a genius commander would do. Maybe it'd be 20%. That'd be my guess. Probably 20% or 25%. Or maybe they'll change it. Maybe they'll give it some buff to acclimatization, which, or maybe organization, which kind of makes sense for, you'd imagine that commandos are more elite trained, so therefore they would have more organization and they would fight harder and longer, which makes sense. But that's kind of cool. So uh, it gives you more incentive to make commandos as the United Kingdom. Also, there's another extra new one here too called Chief of Staff Committee, which you can see here increases the maximum command points by 25, which is similar to what China has at the moment after waking the tiger. And it also increases the amount of command powers you gain by 10% and planning speed by an additional 10%. I love this. I think this is so good. This is kind of how I role play in my head Britain in the Second World War. They... They have a large navy, they have a large air force, and they have a relatively large land force military as well. But because they control so much land over the vast empire of the entire world, uh, they have to make do with what little they've got because they're so spread out across the world. So it kind of, I'd imagine Britain to make, make the most of what little they've got by, in this case, using command powers, using their huge manpower, manpower pool around the world. And I don't know, it, it kind of, it, in my head, it's kind of how I envision the role play of playing as the United Kingdom. So I really like that. I like it a lot. Okay, so what else we got going on here? So let's look at the focus tree a little bit more in depth, see what the other changes. So this is the same as it once was before. So reinforcing the empire benefits industrially towards the empire itself, and that would give you factories and it would also uh, appease the col colonies as well to keep them under the United Kingdom for as long as possible. But now we have the option of revisit the colonial policy. Now, this is kind of a communist route. I imagine you don't have to be communist to go this route. But when you have the ability to go down here, you have the ability to release these nations. But it's just it, I, my first thought when I saw this was like, oh, man, this is stupid. Why would I want to do this? I'm just losing my colonies. I'm losing all the benefits of all these nations around the world and all their manpower pools. Uh, but the bonus to this is you getting manpower. The, the way they have explained this, let me go back to here, is so not only does it give you extra stability, and it, as I said, it does have an impact on communism as well. You gain political power for it. I guess I guess it makes sense the political power because you're kind of releasing having to micromanage the colonies, don't you? You can focus more on UK the interior, but it also gives you a huge amount of manpower. And you're probably thinking, why manpower? Well, the way they've described it is it's kind of like immigration. They kind of see UK as the the head of the empire, and because you've abandoned that colony, they'll probably see the UK as I don't know their home, maybe for instance, and that could cause. In that case, them to go back to the UK. Go back? What am I saying? They were born there. Dave, what are you saying? What, what are you implying, Dave? No, but it gives you an instance that um, if there were, for instance, people working abroad, for instance, they could come back and that would give you a boost of manpower. I like this because it gives you an incentive to actually do this because otherwise it seems stupid to me. It's like, well, this would just be here for role-playing purposes otherwise, and that's just boring. Trust me, I like role-play games. It's cool when you've mastered everything. You just play something just for the lols. But it's kind of cool you get a bonus for that as well. Uh, this is really interesting, the three nation solution. I skimmed through this a little bit earlier in the article. And uh, yeah, depending on what direction you want to go, it can cause lots of instability in the subcontinent. And potentially you could have a weaker India, but then for the late game, have a stronger India. So it's kind of one of those pay for it now, but then benefit it from a later kind of situation. It's going to be interesting how it compares to just going down, reinforce the empire, and just going for independence because this doesn't have any benefit. Uh, doesn't have any negative to it. It feels like this needs to be changed, in my honest opinion, because this side feels like it's keeping the empire under your wing, where well, this one feels like it's releasing the empire. Um, interesting, very interesting. Okay, so just to summarize this, because there's a lot going on here. You've got here. A change in course, which is an ahistorical route. And then you've got steady as she goes. And steady as you goes can break off into two other ones as well. So steady as you goes is the historical route. Which I suppose in a way it's not always historical because home defense is the route you would normally go down for. Actually, is that the historical route? Home defense intervention? I would imagine this, yes, it is, because they got issue gas masks. So this is the historical route. So historical, historical. So these are two democratic options, okay? And here, you've got change of course, which you've got fascism. 
a not I guess this is more of a, uh, a fascist monarch route where here uh, you've got the option to go down actual direct fascist route and then here you've got concessions to the trade unions concessions to the state unions which is the communist route so just to summarize again so said as she goes is kind of like maintaining a historical course of democracy and eventually interve intervening against Germany and you've got home defenses with the historical and you've got here we've got more ahistorical options I guess in this case it's um I guess it's meant to be Churchill. I looked at this a second ago and I was like, is that actually Churchill? So I guess this, it means you're switching out a different leader of um, the Democratic Party in the UK. So this is like an alternative Democratic route. I like that a lot too because it just, it, I know it adds flavor, you know. Well, I looked at this for a second and I'm like, this reminds me of the Romanian focus tree. You know, like you've got the, the monarch, fascist monarch, or you've got the regular monarch. And then you've got communism or democracy. It's like just those four options. And this kind of doesn't doesn't turn me on as much, put it that way. Some interesting things at the bottom, though. For instance, liberate the home of Marx. That's really cool. I really like this. It's going to make the communist tree very interesting. Uh, you've got the option here to either go with Moscow to tackle Germany two-on-one. Or go for an alternative route where eventually you can uh, take on the Soviet Union yourself. And pretty much what you'd expect. I don't know, some of these don't turn me on as much because I feel like we've seen them before. I always kind of like when they think outside of the box. Um, in this case, oh, well, this is an interesting one. So you've got the option to get Spanish support by giving them Gibraltar. So eventually sucking in more into your Anglo-fascist sphere as Britain. Yeah. Sun never sets. I wonder what that one does. Unite the Anglosphere. Hmm. Okay, well, let's go into a little bit more depth how, what, how these focus trees will work in the actual game. So, so no further appeasement. You can see here, um, this is, gives you more of a more interventionist UK. So I guess you've got the roots here of one going down this route, and this gives you. Oh, hang on, where are we going? So this is, gives you the route where you wait for Germany to make their move, and eventually. The, it finally breaks when Poland gets invaded. Well, in this case, you go for a slightly more interventional policy as the United Kingdom, and that gives the instance of no further appeasement. And you can see there's more options here to send volunteers and make do more things uh, with less world tension. So in that case, you could join the Allies and make the Allies and get Poland and the Allies a lot earlier to try and prevent German situation escalating. Uh, this is another instance of where you're trying to change the monarch. Uh, I, I wonder if this is underneath this part of the focus sheet. Oh, this is the fascist route. I'm not 100% certain. Um, just to summarize the situation in the UK, you know that in December of 1936, the monarch abdicates. I believe he wanted to marry someone that had already been divorced, where the church and the government disagreed with that. So in this case, I guess you have the option to try and govern a historical route, but try and place him onto uh, the throne. Maybe we'll have some, in this case, it looks like there's more options available in those decisions. Um, and then you've got issues with, if you do a, a very large swing towards fascism or communism, you could worry about the colonies potentially breaking away. Um, what do we got here? So I guess this case, if those former colonies do choose to break away, you can use political power and weaponry to try and keep them under your belt. This is the fascist route. So in this case, you do marches throughout the UK, spending political power and uh, has an impact of losing stability. And they've described this as a balancing act between keeping the stability above 50% and increase in fascism. Uh, if, you let, if you let your stability drop too low, obviously you get the consequences of low stability, uh, but then you eventually want to keep your fascists going up. So ideally, you want to stay well, above 50% fascism, so you want to get above 50% fascism, and you also want to get above 50% stability, and then eventually you can hold the referendum and marching on Downing Street, which is kind of cool. I like that. It's a nice little cool mini-game. I'm kind of disappointed, though, that they all use political power. Yeah, I'm a bit disappointed with that. It, it, this decision system they've added, I thought was really cool. And I'm kind of disappointed that the route that everyone seems to be taking is everything needs political power. I wish the mod was a bit more creative and used army XP, for instance. Or maybe you have the ability to create your own currency and maybe use that here. I'm not 100% certain. But it would be kind of cool if they did try a slightly different route. Okay, so this is the communist route. So in this case, it, it works in a kind of similar way, really. You're spending political power. 
and you but you do get bonuses for that as well so that gains you extra i guess people who sympathize with the trade unions when you gain communism but it does a lot you gain communism a lot slower so it's kind of a more slower process to move towards communism maybe in that case there'll be less resistance probably in that fact and eventually you demand a referendum when you get enough Co communism uh, and yet again, this looks like more options as well to keep the colonies under your wing when you choose to uh, have a shift in government. And you've got loads of different options available here, deploying loads of manpower abroad. Yet again, costing a lot of political power. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, I just... Maybe it'd be cooler if they cost no political power, but they had a penalty of how much political power you got per day. Kind of like this. I don't know, just to mix it up a little bit. I, I just like to see things that are a little bit different, other than every single decision used in needing political power. Oh, guys, I'm sorry. This has been a very long dev diary, and I feel like I've gave a, a relatively good explanation. There are probably a few points that I wasn't 100% certain on. I read through the dev diary twice to try and get my best understanding, but sometimes it's so difficult to know how the game is going to work until you've got it in your fingertips and you can actually play it. But, man, this gets me really excited. For instance, the... The communist route and the fascist route, I like these mechanics. These feel really good. Um, I also like more interactions with the colonies as well. Maybe if they added more options with decisions that were generic options that you could work with your puppets, other than these that are unique for the UK, that would be pretty damn sweet. Pretty damn sweet. Guys, any questions? Anything you want me to go over? Yeah, again, I'll make a health video if you want me to see, want me to do that. And I'll also make a video on the previous Deb Diary if that's what you guys would really like to see. I hope you have an absolutely epic day. And I will see you guys next time. Peace out, boys. See you soon.